welcome to Test Talk. I'm Ed Mobley. I'm here with my colleague, uh, John McAvoy. Now, now John, uh, you know, we're hearing a lot uh, in the market about user acceptance testing, and, you know, we uh, frequently help our clients uh, with user acceptance testing. And, you know, when I've discussed that, you know, a lot of folks have been like, well, wait a second, I mean, user acceptance testing is about business users getting in there and checking out the application that's being designed for them. So how can, you know, an, an external provider or a third party proxy for users effectively and, and actually enable user acceptance testing? That's a great question, Ed. One of the things I've seen out in the marketplace is this concept of actually bringing in other people in to help with user acceptance testing. And I think there's a couple drivers around that. One, you know, over the last, you know, 15 to 20 years, we've seen a very um, move from the IT organizations, or at least from the major companies, to move to India or other low-cost areas. And it's been a constant push to get to the cheapest resource to do the work. And while sometimes when you have the cheapest resource to do the work, you don't have the best resource to do the work. And so oftentimes, and this isn't everywhere, there are some places that have done this extremely well and been very successful, but where it hasn't, the business has had to come in and pick up a lot of the, the quality problems and actually get it from what is delivered to them to something that they're comfortable going into production. You know, 15 to 20 years ago, that was a different story. The technology was simpler. You know, when the users were coming in, it was often at a much different state than it is today. You know, so they could really sit down and say, yeah, this is something I like or this is something I don't like. You know, in today's day and age, that's not the case. And if you look at with the move to Agile as well, now we're delivering incremental things to the users as well. And the idea is we can actually go through and accept those things real time and have real time releases to production. And that works for small things, but people have taken the Agile concept and actually moved it to larger things as well. So that's a second driver to this. So if I try and do something big with Agile, and I'm not just doing a small incremental change to my production systems. I've got to do a whole bunch of work before I have something that's actually workable for somebody to test from an end-to-end -end process perspective. And so that, again, is an area where the users are supposed to come in and actually accept the system or accept the product and, you know, say it goes into production. Now, they really, truly understand their business and often understand the applications, but the reality is the users often don't understand how to test. They'll often over-test, they'll think they need to look at too many things, or they'll under-test from a standpoint where they miss big swaths of you know, areas of the application that nobody looks at, and when it goes into production, you have problems. So that's why they bring in somebody like us to come in and you know, help organize them, oftentimes doing the heavy lifting from the standpoint of let's get the system of where it's delivered from a technology perspective to where the transaction flows under normal conditions from an end-to-end -end perspective. And then we can actually bring in users to what we used to do with user acceptance testing, which we like to call exploratory testing now, is to say, come in and help us find the one-off scenarios that nobody's going to think about, you know, using a scientific method to come up with what you're going to test. And that's where they'll come in and actually get them to the next level. So, so if I understand this properly, some of the key drivers is, you know, you're seeing a lot of defect leakage into, UA, into the UAT phase and, and business users don't want to yep. be bothered bothered with that and they're busy right and and then also it, it's really industrializing uh, the business's approach to testing it's like if you're going to test it here's a way to you know maximize your scope with with the least of, amount of effort yep now i hear about automation in the context of user acceptance testing and when a lot of folks think about it it's actually the real user hands on keyboard interacting with the application. So how does automation play a role in user acceptance testing? Well, a couple of concepts there. One, it's the users to determine how they want to accept the system. So it's never been that users actually have to sit down and do it. So, you know, you can have, you know, automated testing go through, run the tests, and they can look at the outputs of that and decide whether or not it worked. You know, that's one example. Another way we do it is often to prep data. So if you take an example um, you know, from a, like a utilities, you know, a company that actually, you know, they used to have meters on the, the houses and, they, you know, that would actually roll over. And so if you wanted to test meter rollover to say, okay, the meter rolled over and I did a read and I produced a bill, 
did it actually produce the right amount or did bill did it actually produce some you know million dollar bill because you know it came up with a really big number because the two numbers were reversed from biggest to smallest um, you could actually use automation to set that scenario up and then have them do the last step of checking the bill and, and so I would imagine then in setting up that automation you you're, you're telling the the business users okay this this is what it accomplishes you know you can watch it if you like because it isn't something that's uh, practical to do manually and then you can do your follow-on yeah or you uh, can set up to the data to the point of the thing they want to see and then allow them to manually take it forward both scenarios work so so let's talk about uh, trends in UAT I mean you know everybody's familiar with the, the standard you know the waterfall right where you you have a very formal you know very you know sometimes it could be you know eight weeks uh, if not longer of UAT you know very formal and now you know you have a lot of folks doing agile development where you know in theory you really wouldn't need a formal UAT effort but again you know folks are, are flexing so just from a trend perspective what what are we seeing around UAT, you know, how is it used? You know, what are some of the durations uh, given some of the realities uh, that are out there? Yeah, I see really two. I mean, there's still three. I mean, there are some places that still use kind of a waterfall approach to testing. And those areas, places are becoming less and less and less. Um, but where you see more of an agile or iterative approach, you know, I see really two schools of thought. One is where the users are embedded into the Scrum team and they test alongside the developers and they release directly to production. Again, the challenge with that comes when I'm actually trying to do things that take multiple sprints or multiple scrum teams to actually deliver a change to a process to deliver a new capability. So in that particular case, I can't test end to end until a bunch of things come together. And so if I spread that across the scrum teams, which scrum team actually runs the test when it's all done? And how do you know it's all done? So Part of that is, is when you're doing this, you have to be very disciplined on how you actually track your done criteria from a standpoint, not just from a piece of code perspective, but from the, you know, the epic that I'm trying to enable. And when do I actually test that epic or when do I actually test that business process and who's accountable for it? In that case, I actually see some you know, you know, teams opting to do a kind of a test only scrum. So they'll go for two or three sprints, you know, uh, behind where the development is, you know, and then they'll actually test the process stuff as it comes in together. Um, and then I've seen that work, but I've also seen them trying to do it a bit. The bigger you get from a standpoint of what you're trying to accomplish, the harder it is to actually do it inside the Scrum team. So once you get to a critical mass, then you have this, you know, the separate team that does it. And that's where you have to have a lot of discipline because if you don't, you end up having the dev teams actually develop a bunch of stuff that none of it actually connects together until the end. So you end up what I would call with waterfall with no stage containment, trying to test all the quality in at the end. So there's a real discipline that has to be put in place to make that second, you know, option work. And and so the test only scrums, I mean, I've heard, you know, folks use the term and, you know, I've seen this uh, hardening, hardening sprints. Yep. Uh, we're talking, okay, about the same thing. And so I would think, you know, even if you, you have a, uh, a hardening sprint, you know, the actors, uh, you know, within that sprint may be more, you know, technologically focused and there's still the need, uh, you know, to have more business involvement. Hence, you know, there's still a driver for uh, a separate UAT cycle. Generally, I don't see that in Agile to have that separate UAT cycle. The big push is to pull the UAT testers into the scrum teams to be spark part of that kind of that epic test. Um, so I have a once and done. So it's more of a partnership between technology and the business. The challenge is if you just have technology people in there, they may not understand the business process. So one of the things we do when we outsource um, UAT or come in and you know assist with a large transformational program in UAT is we take all the testers and we'll map out the business process and we'll create certification programs against the business process itself. So that way you can be sure that the tester understands what they're testing. And that's huge from the standpoint of one, actually getting something that works in production and not finding a bunch of defects, but it has a, a significant impact on overall tester productivity. Somebody understands what they're testing. They're much more likely to do it quickly, efficiently, and correctly, and not create a bunch of noise in the system, 
from a standpoint of creating defects that aren't defects, but also they're able to do their work a lot more faster and efficiently. And, and, and so summing it all up, I mean, if we look at some of our clients, particularly, you know, say in the financial services industry, you know, they may be engaging vendors who, who develop in, in, in an agile fashion. And then at the end of the day, they know that their business users need to get in there and, and give it the, the thumbs up. So, so let's kind of summarize all the stuff that, that may happen in, in between and, and how an organization uh, could leverage, you know, whether it's uh, a, an Ernst & Young or, or a third-party vendor to, to just help facilitate that, that process end to end. I think the key thing is, one, you know, where does it make sense to do this? And the, the, if I'm a business owner and I've got poor quality coming to, to me, and the only way I can actually affect change is to actually test it in, you know, that's where I see a bunch of people building these large UIT teams. The reality is we'd rather work with our clients to say, okay, well, how do we integrate back into technology um, and improve the quality coming out of technology and then implement an efficient UAT process? And we can actually help with both of those. You know, first part is oftentimes stopping the bleeding, you know, getting something so you start releasing the production over and over and over again with consistency um, and predictability. Then the second part is how do you actually drive that efficiency back into the technology organizations to improve the stuff that's being delivered to UAT. Ideally, you know, places where I've been in the past where you had a really good technology team, UAT then becomes a change management activity where you bring in users, they do exploratory testing, not really to find defects, but to learn the system. Because the quality being delivered out of the, the, the technology delivery is so high quality that they're not really trying to find defects at that point. So, so it sounds like you know, a lot of pre-work is being done you know, before UAT, and so you identify business users who are going to participate in UAT. Do you, do you first orient them to let them know, hey, you know, here's the work or the pre-work that's been done so that you know, they have an idea of, of where they could, could focus their efforts? Is that traditionally? Actually, I'd rather, work? traditionally they like do that, but to me it's around mapping out the business processes. Here are the business processes that we're trying to enable, and here are the changes to those business processes. And then, one, making sure the business process functions correctly. So that's getting it to the 95%. And then bringing in business users that actually have deep knowledge of the system and actually know things that commonly occur in production or not commonly occur that can occur that usually cause problems. And then have them come try those things. That's actually the huge value of having users come in and test. Getting to that 95%, you know, we can train people to map out the business processes. We use tools to determine coverage. Um, we can actually do a bunch of that automated and say, okay, our done criteria is we pass all these tests at this level of coverage. Now it's ready to have a user come in and actually look at it. And that's, you know, that's the optimal area you need. Whether it's the technology teams delivering that to the users up front, or if you have a situation where the technology team really feels their mandate is the features and functions, and it's the business's responsibility to actually validate the processes, you know, you know, putting in an industrialized approach to validate the process first before we have actual users come in and actually hit the system. And I, I think it's also important to note that even if an organization were to, uh, you know, retain third-party uh, support to, to help them uh, with UAT, they still don't, they're, they're still the, the final arbiter of, of whether this, this application is, is fit for purpose is, is my opinion. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You need a process in that one, you know, somebody from the business actually, you know, signs off on what's going to be tested. You know, somebody actually is involved in the defect management process to say, yes, the defect severity is set correctly. I mean, we can do the first level triage or your vendor can do the first level triage. But in the end, the arbitrary of what severity a defect is should be coming from somebody in the business. And then finally looking at the end results to say, okay, here's what we tested, here's what the results, here's what the outstanding defects are. Yes, I'm ready to go. That again needs to be somebody from the business organization making those decisions. Um, and that would just be like if they were doing all the UAT themselves, except this play, they have all the materials and they have the controls set in place to be able to make those decisions in a logical, well-informed way. Well-informed and it sounds to me more efficient, Yes. right? Well, John, is, is there anything else you, you'd like to add? Uh, just that this is a trend that we're seeing in the, 
the market these days, more and more people are asking us around how to do UAT services. Um, we talked about earlier of what we think some of the drivers are that, but you know, it's an exciting place to be and you know, you know, understanding our clients' business is our strength as a company. So we're well suited to actually help deliver these services. Well, John, thank you. And uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, we will have a white paper uh, with this video. Uh, you'll see a link to that uh, white paper in the uh, description below, as well as uh, contact information. Again, we really appreciate uh, your time and joining us here on Test Talk. Until next time.